Kleenex right now here. But you can be seated. You can be seated because there's a few little things that have to happen before we go any farther. Um, one of the reasons why we're here, and it is so good to see such a marvelous crowd here today in the presence of the Lord. What a wonderful, wonderful place to be. Amen. In the presence of Amen. the Lord. Yes, it is. What a wonderful place to be. See, while I was sitting there listening to this wonderful worship team, the song that came to my mind, and I don't know if you know it, and I'm not sure I know it completely, but it just resonated in my mind. Worship his majesty. Worship his majesty. And we're here today to worship his majesty. The king of kings. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. They said to him, this is the sermon, but they said to him, they said to him, Lord, save us, we perish. Master, carest thou not? And he arose. And he said to the winds and the waves that he had created, he said, peace be still, because you're scaring my friends. These are my friends. Behave yourself. And immediately, immediately, the winds and the waves obey him. And the disciples looked at him and looked at each other and said, What manner of man is this that even the winds and the waves Obey him. I think I ought to obey him. Yeah. If the winds and the waves obey him. Because he is our majesty. Yes. Yes. Worship his majesty. Yes. Praise the Lord. I just feel like we ought to just raise our hands. Yes. And just, if you want to stand up, go ahead. I think we ought to worship his majesty. His majesty. We thank you, Lord, for your wonderful power and blessing and goodness. Thank you, Lord. 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 Hallelujah. 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 Blessed be the name of the Lord. Glory to the Lord. God is good. God is good. Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. there'll come a day when this is all going to be over. That's right. All going to be over. And then we'll have the opportunity to cast our crowns before him. We'll just be casting our crowns before him. See? He gave them to us and we're going to give them back to him. Because he is our majesty. He's our majesty. So thank you so much for for a good welcome today. Thank you very much for the blessing of the Lord. Let's stay, let's stay tuned in for the next few moments. As we go through this, let us stay tuned in. Because there's something special about the presence of the Lord in this place today. Amen. And I know you can feel it. So we're grateful for that. Praise the Lord. Now, first of all, one of the reasons why we're here today. We flew in three weeks ago from the United Kingdom, and we flew into JFK, and uh, we had, had had some conversation with, uh, with my sister in the Lord, Tammy, and her husband, Jim, with regards to this event. And uh, Bishop Miller nudged me here a little while ago, and he said, so, he said, did Tammy know anything about this? I said, well, yeah, we've been, this has been in the works for about four months. 
So uh, it's, but one of the reasons why we're here is because last year, as you know, the world was kind of shook to its core with COVID-19. And we're still, we're still seeing the effects of it today, but hopefully not as bad as it was last year because we've learned many to manage it a little bit better. But in, in the same token, we, in May of last year, we decided that because of the way things were going, that we would send Bishop Miller's birthday card a little early to make sure that he got it on time for August the 1st. And <clears throat> he's still waiting for it. <laughs> yeah, that's a fact. It never, ever arrived. I kept checking with Tammy, and, and I'm like, did, did it arrive yet? Because we sent it like on the 12th of May. And so they said, no, it, she says, it has not arrived. So we're getting up to the time, and sure enough, it didn't arrive. So you know what? Lori and I talked about it, and we just decided that this year, we were not going to put that card into the hands of the Royal Mail of England. <laughs> and we weren't going to put it into the hands of the the United States Postal Service, but we were just gonna go ahead and deliver it ourselves. Right here. picture there that uh, I'd like them to just pop up like as soon as possible. <laughs> Christ Church Pentecostal, we're grateful to be here. My wife Lori and I are thrilled to be here. Hmm. There's an interesting picture. My word. Now, who is that? Huh? Well, I'm sure you recognize a young man that's at the back. But I'm not sure you recognize the young man that's at the front. Because the young man that had the front back then had hair. <laughs> Today, for one reason or the other, God got tired of counting so many hairs. <laughs> and he, uh, he reduced the inventory. But that is my godfather, Bishop Mervyn Douglas Miller. And this picture was taken on a Sunday school picnic in Northern Ireland in 1952. And this is me right here. And I'm being looked after by a very special person, my Uncle Mervyn. As a little boy, I called him Uncle Mercy. <laughs> that was his name, as far as I was concerned. He was my uncle, and he was full of mercy. See, you might say, well, geez, you know, Brother Vincent mentioned today something very important. He said, we're all part of the same family. Yes. And whether you like it or not, you're my brother, right. and you're my sister. Right. And that's all there is to it. We don't have to worry about anything. We're my brother, and we're my sister. And that's my uncle right there. My mother met this young man when he was six years old. My mother was 11. Bishop Miller was six years old. And my mother and her sister and brother and my grandmother and Brother Miller's family were part of the original signing group of people that formulated what today is the Churches of God in Northern Ireland. And that is a oneness organization that has several churches and several thousand people that have actually reached out around the globe. God has used these folk to be a blessing and an encouragement everywhere, including Jacksonville, yeah. Florida. So, so Lori and I are thrilled to be at Christ Church Pentecostal. Thank you to Pastor and Sister Mervyn Todd Miller for this very kind and gracious invitation to speak. Thank you to my godfather and precious Aunt Marilyn 
Aunt Marilyn has just been pretty special to me as well. When I met her, I was only about, uh, well, I was about eight years old. Because uh, when I met Tammy, she was nine months old. So they came over to Selsen and they were with us at that time. So we go back a ways and I have, <clears throat> I have enjoyed a wonderful time um, with these folks. Now Bishop Miller is 88 years old today. My mother, God willing, will be 93 on September the 28th. And when I turned 70 on May the 10th, I said to my mother, I said, what is it like to have a 70-year-old son. She looked at me and she said, <laughs> but you see, when we talk about these things, we talk about our heritage. We talk about where God brought us from to where God has brought us to. And this is so beautiful that we're even here today. This is a divine appointment. This is a divine appointment. This did not happen by accident. There is no way in the world that this thing took place just because I woke up one morning and had some bright idea that I wanted to be here to, with my godfather for his 88th birthday. But God allowed us to be here today so that we could have this opportunity. Graciously, your pastor has allowed me to speak to you today. And all I want to do is talk to you uh, from my heart as to what it is that God wants me to say. Yes, right. This is not Gordon Campbell's word. This is the word of the Lord. God has something special for us yes. today. Amen. Amen. You see, he has something special for us today. And that's a beautiful thing. And I want to thank James and Tammy McCauley for the wonderful hospitality in their lovely home. We arrived here on Friday evening. So it's all been kind of hush-hush and quiet. And so it's all been kind of there so that this morning, whenever you walked in, it would be a bit of a surprise. And it was, right? So happy birthday, and it's so nice to spend some time with Natalie and Brindley. Very nice to, to be with you folks. And of course, through Facebook and through our life, and some of the ministry that we have uh, been blessed to do in the United Kingdom, we have just had a nice relationship with a wonderful young man called Douglas. Amen. And so we're very grateful yes. for the wonderful heritage that we continue on through our life. Yes. With one Miller and one triplet, and one person, one Macaulay, one right after the other. Isn't it amazing how God opens these doors for us? And you, as the pastor said today, you've got your own personal testimony, but I've got a testimony right now that says, and I shared this with Pastor Miller, I have a testimony that says that Brother Vincent came in <clears throat> and looked at my sermon notes. You may talk. Must have been sometime late last night whenever we were all slumbering. But this is how God works, how God brings things together. Let me just share this with you. This is a book called All the Fullness. We are great, greatly blessed to be able to share this around the world. This is actually a picture of my father, David Campbell, who was a personal friend of the Miller family for many, many years. I can tell you that one quick little funny story, whenever I had my first birthday, okay, we were in Belfast, Northern Ireland, had my first birthday, and um, my dad, I was, I was born in May, so this was December, so I was about eight or nine months old. And my dad bought me a train set. So it was one of those wind-up jobs. Uh, back then, they didn't have electricity, you know, that long ago. But I'm just kidding. But it was a wind-up job. So Christmas morning, 
in my Granny Bessie's home on 32 Glen Till Street in Belfast, Bishop Miller, young man, comes over and he and my dad put the train set together for Gordon. But you see, Gordon was only like eight or nine months old. So they're sitting on the floor with the, when they finally get it together, they are putting it on and they are playing with my train set on Christmas morning. So my Granny Bessie, who was great friends with Annie Miller, who was Bishop Miller's mother, they were great friends together. She comes out of the kitchen, and how do I know this? Well, you know, I mean, I've been told this story. When I was eight months old, I didn't know what they were saying. So she comes out of the kitchen, and Bessie was, was kind of a in charge kind of lady. So she looked and she says, well, we know who that train set was bought for. <laughs> so it was bought for my dad and for Brother <laughs> to have a Merry Christmas. So, you know, these are, these are little stories. You've got tons of them as well about your own life, but I'm given the opportunity to say a few things today about it. So, <clears throat> In this book that I showed you, All the Fullness, it, we are, we've been blessed to be able to republish this book. It is available on Amazon. It's available as a paperback. It's also available as a Kindle. And right now, uh, countries, of course, the, the forward inside is a lovely forward here. And that forward was written by Mervyn D. Miller back in 1973. So this book now, since it was republished in 2017, it is now being used to teach the message of the oneness of God in, you might recognize the name of some of these places. It is being used to teach the message of the oneness of God in Hong Kong, Macau, the Philippine Islands, the United States of America, the United Kingdom, Zambia, Nigeria, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, Uganda, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Botswana, South Africa, and Burundi. And over 300 pastors in Zambia alone are using this book to teach the message of the oneness of God. Isn't it amazing what God can do? Isn't that amazing what God can do? This is all God. This is the powerful God that you and I serve, His Majesty. His Majesty. If you have your Bibles, or if you want to bring it up on the screen, we're going to be looking at uh, John chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. We're going to read through verse 11. And this title that God gave me for this message today, um, I, I rejoice because I am the bearer of good news. Yes, praise. I have come here today assigned by the Lord, sanctioned by the pastor of this church to deliver the good news. Good news. Good news. So that's an exciting assignment that I have received today, and it just puts a smile on my face. Because I know that I'm going to be talking about some things that if you will allow them to work on your heart, that they will help you and they will change you and they will enhance your day-to-day -day living yeah. so that you will have a better life Amen. as long as you're here. Amen. Now, we all understand that there will come a time when we will transition into eternity. Right. We realize that. But while you're here, don't you think it would be nice to be able to have a grasp on the best life that is possible for you to have? The very best life, a life of real blessing. Now you might say, well, you know what? It's kind of an odd title. But stay with me on it, okay? All right, so come on, what is it? 
We're going to be talking today about this thought. Jesus was not a stoner. Hmm? Jesus was not a stoner. Can you turn to your neighbor and just say to them, Jesus was not a stoner. Huh? Say it again, would you? I want you to kind of get the grasp of what we're talk talking about. Jesus was not a stoner. Now look, I understand what the modern connotations of that terminology are, and that's not exactly what we're going to be talking about here today. But necessarily, as we read through this passage of Scripture and one other, we will discover that Jesus was not a stoner. Huh? Stay with me on it, okay? Let's dive right in. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. And early in the morning, he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him. And he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Because Jesus wasn't a stone. Hmm? As though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted himself up and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted himself up himself, and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, This is very special to me. This is very special. Neither do I condemn thee. Go thy way and sin no more. So if we look at Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14 and 16, just to finish up this Bible reading, we can see that something special happened at this moment. This moment was truly a life-changing moment for this woman. Yes. It was the beginning of the rest of her life. It was the beginning. And so if we look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 through 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest, that is passed into the heavens, 
Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but in all points tempted like as we, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of me. So ask yourself a question right now. Am I in a time of need? Am I in a time of need? Undoubtedly, without any reservation, I think all of us could agree and say that this woman that had been caught in the very act of adultery was in a time of need in her life. She was there for a moment, hanging, suspended between life and death. And according to the law of Moses, those men in the temple had every right, every law, every opportunity to just execute judgment, and that was it. No one would question it at all. They would just carry it out and probably had on occasion before. But this time was different. The reason it was different is because this time they brought her in front of Jesus. And Jesus was not a stoner. Jesus was not a stoner. They brought her in front of Jesus. And Jesus was not a stoner. Matthew 1 21, the angel came and said, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Right. His role was completely different than the judgment of those that were in the temple. He was bringing a new covenant. He was bringing a new opportunity. He was bringing a new blessing to people so that they could live. Live. Amen. Not die, but live. She had every opportunity to, to, to say Lord here I am oh God I don't know I wish I hadn't done it but here we go but fortunately for her she came in contact personally with Jesus Christ Jesus. she did she came in contact personally with Jesus Christ my life changed when I came in contact personally with Jesus Christ. It ch everything changed. It all changed. I began to live in the glory of the Lord. Now, does that mean that you've always been perfect? I've never been perfect. I can assure you of that. What are you saying? I'm not perfect. He's perfect. So if you're here today and you have that feeling that you're perfect, wow. Not true. The only one that's perfect is him. And that brings up an interesting point as far as I'm concerned when I read this particular passage of scripture in John chapter 8. Because Jesus made a very, very important of important statement. See, if we were perfect, we would not need a Savior. If we were perfect, then why did Calvary even happen? Why did it even take place? Why did Jesus suspend himself between heaven and earth and give his life 
for you and me. If we were perfect, why in the world did that have to happen? But it was because of our imperfections that Jesus died for us. His blood is the currency of redemption. People ask, why did Jesus become, why did God become a man? It was because of one reason. Only one reason. The blood. The blood. There's no other reason. Because God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So in other words, it was, it was necessary for blood to be shed, right. for remission of sins. Matthew 26, 27, and 28 says, Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Hebrews 9.22 says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission of sins. Jesus fulfilled the law by being the lamb slain, and that is why Acts 2.38 is so important as it states the death, burial, and resurrection in the plan of forgiveness. Amen. But what is so important about what we read earlier in Hebrews chapter 4, it is because the only person, the only person, I want you to, to just hold, hold on to this for a moment. Because if you in your life are in a time of need, this might be that life raft. Or this might be that rope that you can reach out for and help you. Hebrews chapter 4 says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So when Jesus was making the decree as he is presented with this woman that has been caught in an awful sin. He made an important statement. He said, those of you that are without sin, And please forgive me if I get emotional at this point in time. Because I have been forgiven. Yes, amen. Mm -hmm. I have been forgiven. I have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But I have been forgiven. Amen. Glory. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Anybody else here feel that same way? I have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but I have been forgiven. I am a living testimony of the grace and mercy and forgiveness of Almighty God. And I believe that if God can save me, he can save anybody. Anybody. Oh, I'm, I've just done so many things. I've just done this, I've done that. This woman was caught in the act of adultery and the law of Moses said that she ought to die. But Jesus said, he said, anybody that is without sin, let him pick up and let him hurl the first stone. But Hebrews chapter 4 tells us that in that crowd, there was only one person that was without sin. Just one person that was without sin. But see, Jesus was not a stoner. Jesus was not a stoner. 
He was a savior. He was a savior. He was a savior. That's why what I'm talking about today is good news. Because you're not going to die as a result of some hypocrite taking a stone and crashing your skull in. But you are going to be raised to walk in a new life through the power of redemption in Jesus Christ who purchased your salvation with the last drop of his blood on Calvary's cross and he was buried on the third day. He rose from the grave and he brought up from the grave the keys to death, hell, and the grave. And you do not have to live your life in self-pity or in judgment or in worry or in fear. You can live it in faith. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. And one of the most special things about Jesus is that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if he will direct your path 80 years ago, if he'll direct your path, 4,000 years ago, he's still available yes. to direct your path today. Yes. The one person that had the right and the license to pick up that stone and crush her skull to let her brains come leaking out on the ground. The one person that could have done that made such a beautiful statement. He said this, and I think he's talking to you this morning, because I know he talked to me. He said this, neither, neither do I condemn thee. Go thy way and sin no more. Because Jesus was not a stoner. Jesus was the Savior. John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17 says this. And this applies to you because it applied to me. And if God can save me, he can save anyone. John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. For God. And put your name in there, would you? Put your name. I'm going to put mine in there. All right? So would you put your name in there? For God so loved for him that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, not get stoned, should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You might be saved today if you would just simply turn your life over to the Lord Jesus Christ right now in this place. And simply say, Lord, if you save Gordon Campbell, and the promise is for everybody that hears the word of the Lord, I believe that you can save me. Jesus had to shed his blood for our salvation. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. So 
if you need forgiveness for anything at all today, it's time to get under the blood of Jesus Christ and let him wash you clean. So, you know, I think God's been given a bum rap. I just think God's been given a bum rap. So many places paint his picture as some ogre. Some ogre that is just looking for the least opportunity to knock you down. But that's not the way Jesus is. So if you're here today and you have sinned. All have sinned. And come short of the glory of God. The good news that I bring to you today. The good news is we have a Savior. We have a Savior. That woman couldn't do it on her own. She got caught red-handed. She needed a Savior. She needed a Savior. They brought her to him to trap him. They brought her to him to trap him. And instead of trapping him, he liberated her. He turned the table. He liberated her. There's some folks here today that have been liberated. Amen. Hmm? Yeah. Thank you. Liberated. Thank you. Some folks here today that have been liberated. Are you glad that you've been liberated? Amen. Are you happy that Jesus Christ Amen. You, said Jesus. neither, neither, neither? Put your name in there. Hmm? Neither, Gordon. Neither, Gordon, do I condemn thee. Go thy way and sin no more. Does that mean that you'll never, ever sin again? No, it doesn't. But it does mean that when you meet the Savior, you'll always have the Savior. He's there for you. Every single day that you need that help and you need that moment. See, I'm that story. Much as you might wonder, I'm that story. I'm that little boy that was raised in that Christian home. I was that little boy that grew up and was part of the ministry team in the United Kingdom in the 1970s when Bishop Miller was the general superintendent of the United Pentecostal Church in Great Britain. I was the second national youth leader of that organization. I was that little boy in that picture. But there came a time in my life when things got really tough. It got really, really tough. March the 15th, 1980, I drove my father, David Campbell, to John F. Kennedy Airport. He had been on a teaching tour in the United States, and one of the places that he actually taught was North Little Rock with then Pastor Miller and his church in North Little Rock, Arkansas. But on March the 15th, and you might say to me, you know what? You don't know the tough times that I've gone through. You don't know the tough times I'm going through. Just hear me out for a moment. I'm getting ready to close here. March the 15th, 1981. From Binghamton, New York, upstate New York, I drove my father three and a half hours to John F. Kennedy Airport. He was sitting in the back seat. He hadn't had a great night. So whenever I got to in front of the terminal where he was going to, uh, to get the plane, I wanted to let him out, and then I was going to go park the car. And then I'd be right. 
when I came around, his ankles were so enlarged from what we met, later found out was congestive heart failure. His ankles were so large that I couldn't put his shoes on for him. And I thought that was something that I would like to do for my father, who had loved me and been my dad. I'd like to have been able to put his shoes on for him and tie his legs before he caught the plane to go back to England to be with my father. I'd like to do that. But I couldn't do that because his ankles were so in line. And I said to the porter, would you bring a wheelchair, please? Need a wheelchair. They got my dad in a wheelchair. I said, please don't go anywhere because I'm just going to quickly go park in the short-term parking and I'm going to be right back and I want to say goodbye to my dad. So I raced over there, parked the car, got the ticket, and ran back. And he was gone. And so I ran in there, and I ran down the corridor where he was supposed to be going to the terminal. Back then, you were able to go right down to the terminal right. to say goodbye right. to your loved ones when they were taking the flight. So I was racing down there. And I got down there, and there was a young lady that was standing there all nicely dressed up, had the cap on and the whole works. And I said to her, I said, Madam, Madam, excuse me, please. I was just 29 years old at the time. Pastoring a church in upstate New York. And I said, Madam, where's my father? And she's like, Who's your dad? I said, well, they must have brought him down here in a wheelchair. And she said, yes, he's already on the plane. I said, but I wanted to be able to say goodbye to my dad. And they said, well, I'm very sorry, sir, but the gate is closed and the door is closed. My father, 53 years old, was sitting on that plane that plane got airborne, and at 1.15 in the afternoon, as they were heading out, they were going to Dallas, Texas for him to catch a plane to go back to England. In the mid-air, he had a massive heart attack. And they tried to help him. They, they assured us that they had done everything they could. They put oxygen on him. There was two nurses that were on that flight. They tried to help him. They did everything they could. But when I drove back from JFK and I walked in the back door of my house, the phone was being answered and the word came. And I looked and I said, is everything all right? And the person that had the phone was like, So when they hung up the phone, they turned to me and they said, mid-flight, your father passed away. Mid-flight. I have never felt the amount of grief that just came up and out of me at that point in time as I began to cry. That was a life-changing moment in my life. Unfortunately, I didn't handle it well. Remember that scripture I talked to you about a few minutes ago? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Trust me, folks. Sometimes it's easier than others. So instead of me hitting my knees and saying to God, where do I grow from here? Because my life was about to take on a different direction. My father, who had been very, very kind to me and loving to me and taking care of everything for me, was gone. Where do I grow from here? But instead of saying that, I said in anger, God, where do I go from here? And it wasn't too long after that, just a few years later, that I just walked away. 
I turn my back on God. But you know what the beautiful thing is about Jesus not being a stoner? He never turned his back on me. Amen. And I can remember during those 19 years of darkness, I can remember that God was with me and provided certain people. I was running car dealerships at that time. And every dealership that I went to run, there was a Christian witness in that car dealership that revealed themselves to me just after I began running that store. They came up to me and for some reason or another, they said, do you know the Lord? Because I'm a believer. I believe that that was God nudged that person because God wanted me to know that he was on the way with me. 2007, I was sitting in my business, November of 2007. I was actually standing looking out the window. I had just had to lay off my best friend. It was right in the middle of the financial crisis. And all of a sudden, God spoke to my heart and he said to me, it's time to pray. 2007, been 19 years. And I said to him, see, you can have a conversation with God. Yes. You can chat with God. You can, he talks to you. You can talk to him. I said to him, I said, but Lord, it's been so long. I've forgotten how to pray. I'm being real with you today. Amen. I'm being real with you today. Because this is as real as it is. Yes. This is like that woman. Her life was suspended at that moment between life and death. And the only thing that made a difference for her was the fact that she was in the presence of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is the only thing that saved her from death. Nothing else. So the Lord spoke in my heart and I told him, I said, I'm very sorry. You need to be honest with God. Don't have a mask. Take the mask off. Just be honest with God. He's not going to hurt you. He loves you. He came to save you. I said to him, I said, I forgot how to pray. Big preacher. Big evangelist. National Youth Director, leader of the church, pastor. You've forgotten how to pray? Yes. I have to be that honest with God. And God spoke to my heart and he said, simply do this. Just pray the prayer that I told my disciples. And at that moment, I just started. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespass, as we forgive those that trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And it was my fortunate moment in my life that at that point, even though I have wandered away from God, God never wandered away from me. And even though I deserved to die, even though I had done things that were worthy of death, instead of that happening to me, I met Jesus as a Savior, yes. not as a stone. Right. And I would venture a guess today that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yes, he is. And he's not looking to stone you. He's not looking to stone you. 
is looking to save it. This could be the beginning of a great life for you today. God did not bring you here by accident. He brought you here on purpose so that you could hear good news that he's your savior. He is not ready to stone you. He is ready to save you. Perhaps you would do me the kindness of just closing your eyes and bowing your head with me if you would at this moment. There was an old song that we used to sing way back. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. You see, they all left, and the only ones that were left, the only ones that were left, were her and Jesus. And he said to her, Where are those thine accusers? And she looked at him and she said, There are none, Lord. And he said, Neither do I condemn thee. Go thy way and sin no more. That same Savior that was there for her is here for you right now. Today, simply ask the Lord, Lord, forgive me of my sins, and Lord, the Lord will lead you. David said, you lead me in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. The gifts that are before you are staggering. The things that God wants to do for, for you from this day on are absolutely unimaginable. But first of all, he wants to forgive you. Then he wants to see your sins washed away in water baptism like my wife Lori in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he wants to fill you with the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And it's like the, the curtains are pulled back. Imagine this. The curtains are pulled back and you walk clean into a brand new life that you didn't even believe existed and was available to you. It is. It is. Would you stand with me right now, please? And those of you that might feel to do it, I'm just going to ask Pastor Miller if he would come up here and just take us from here. He knows you better than I do, and he knows that God's here right now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. God bless. Thank you so much. Thank you.